We must all work together to get through this pandemic and support is needed. Regional Council passed a unanimous motion at the Board of Health earlier this week requesting further assistance from the provincial and federal governments to help us tackle the increase in COVID-19 community spread in our region. The Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario, Dr. Williams, has applauded our local Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Wong, for the steps taken, including Section 22 class order region-wide and uh, specifically Section 22 class order for the Old Order, Markham, Old Colony, and David Martin Mennonite communities in the rural areas of our region. I spoke with Premier Doug Ford yesterday to stress the concerns of our community spread and specific issues within the Mennonite communities, as well as the outbreaks in workplace settings. He indicated his willingness to continue us to be a strong partner and we are working with the province. I echoed the request that Dr. Wong has made to the Provincial Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Williams, for additional resources in case and contact tracers, as well as continued support personnel for enforcement, specifically Ministry of Labor officers. We appreciate the help we've um, given, we've gotten so far, but our case rate continues to rise and we're seeking and seeing increased outbreaks um, and spread, especially in workplace settings. Additional case and contact and enforcement staff will allow us to be more successful under the current restrictions and identify and help slow the spread to avoid future lockdown. Regional support, the region supports local business. Avoiding a future lockdown is exactly what our restaurants and local businesses want. We are working with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario and locally, our business network, Best WR, to advocate for fair and manageable solutions for small businesses, as well as providing much needed information and support to ensure businesses have what they need to comply with public health guidelines, keep patrons and the community safe, and as a result, to remain open. Please remember to support your local businesses over the next few weeks. Many rely on the holiday season to get through them through the winter. The second week of provincial multi-ministerial education enforcement campaign with over 30 provincial officers was deployed in Waterloo Region and it ended Saturday, September the 28th. A summary of the provincial team includes almost 500 total businesses were visited. 77% of the businesses visited were found to be in compliance. 115 businesses had contraventions. Three total tickets were issued for a sports fitness business, a restaurant and an auto service retail business, and five total COVID related occupational health and safety act orders to comply were issued. 42 places were flagged for a return visit by the multi-ministerial team. The region enforcement updates for the week of November 26 to December 2nd include a number of tickets issued. The City of Waterloo bylaw issued three tickets to occupants of three different private residents for failing to obey and the continued order under the Reopening Ontario Act for exceeding gathering limits. These tickets were all a total payable of $880. The City of Kitchener bylaw issued one ticket to the occupant of a private resident for failing to obey a continued order under the reopening Ontario Act for exceeding gathering limits. This ticket was an $880 fee. The Region of Waterloo bylaw issued two tickets under the Regional Mask bylaw. Both were issued at an apartment building to tenants who were not wearing masks in common areas. Each ticket was $200 each. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the region has chaired the Community Support Control Group, which is a collection of social service agencies working together to respond to those in need, who in, which include housing, food security, children's services, animal care, volunteer services, and mental health supports. The group continues to coordinate social supports for individuals and families who experience these types of challenges. In addition, a strong connection with the Volunteer Action Centre continues to ensure that volunteers uh, are registered, are trained and ready and able to respond to the gaps in the service of frontline delivery 
to administration. During the height of the first wave, this group met several times weekly and continues to meet regularly with the same purpose in mind, ensuring that nobody falls through the cracks. A community leader who is critical to the community support and helping um, the local response to our community who is in need will be our guest panelist this week. We're pleased to be joined by Wendy Campbell, CEO of the Region of Waterloo Food Bank. But first I welcome Dr. Wong, our Medical Officer of Health to deliver her update. Welcome Dr. Wong. Thank you, Chair Redmond. Good morning, everyone. Waterloo Region's case rate of COVID-19 is the fourth highest in the province right now. Residents should consider that COVID-19 is broadly spreading in our community. Our indicators are concerning. Our incidence rate has climbed to its highest level to date, 90 cases per 100,000 per week. Our current percent positivity taking into account interim data is 4.1%. Our reproductive rate has fluctuated between 1.1 and 1.4 in the last few days. We continue to see new outbreaks on a daily basis, often in workplace settings. Hospitalizations continue to increase and local hospitals have begun to temporarily reduce some elective surgeries to better manage ICU capacity. Due to the number and complexity of cases, contacts, and outbreaks, which have increased rapidly. Last week, I asked residents who become aware that they have tested positive before we are able to reach them to start notifying their close contacts while awaiting a call from public health. Now, in addition, in order to ensure we can prioritize higher risk situations for direct follow-up investigation by public health, in situations of lower risk, we will be asking cases to notify their own close contacts and workplaces. Public health will also be sending information to those workplaces to enable them to carry out contact tracing in their settings to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Public health will continue to directly investigate or follow up contacts for higher risk situations, such as outbreaks and for settings such as long-term care, retirement and congregate care, health care, home care, emergency services and schools and daycares. We appreciate the ongoing support of council and their recent advocacy to the province for resources to support our continued efforts to manage this surge. On Wednesday, I mentioned that we are seeing more workplace outbreaks and that spread in such settings is most often occurring from employee to employee. We know that the public health measures of employee screening, physical distancing, face coverings, and staying home if you have any symptoms are effective. In addition, in indoor settings, it is important to ensure good ventilation and maintenance of HVAC systems. Ventilation with fresh outdoor air is encouraged. Avoid recirculation of air as far as practically possible. Ensure good, clean filters, control humidity, and optimize air change rates. Facilities should consult their HVAC contractor or maintenance staff regarding optimizing ventilation in these ways, as well as ensuring routine inspection and maintenance. 
In closing, many in our community are enduring significant hardships as a result of the current restrictions we are under. We need to all pull together to maximize our chances of slowing the spread without the need for further restrictions. We need to act now. I am asking all residents to limit social interactions to only those people in your immediate households. Stay home and only leave for essential purposes, such as for groceries or takeout, work, school, or medical appointments. Continue to practice the public health measures of physical distancing, wearing a face covering, proper hand hygiene, and avoiding enclosed, crowded spaces that are not well ventilated. And if you have symptoms, stay home, self-isolate from others, and seek testing. We need to do everything we can to help each other. And I encourage you to support local businesses or local charities while you're at it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. And now we'll hear from Wendy Campbell, CEO of Waterloo Regional Food Bank. Welcome, Wendy. You're on mute, Wendy. I knew that was going to happen. Thank you, Chair Redman and Dr. Wong, for inviting me to join you today. I would like to start by thanking the essential workers, the staff and volunteers in our Community Food Assistance Network for their continued uh, commitment to ensuring that no one goes hungry in Waterloo Region. For those of you who don't know, Waterloo Region has one of the most innovative food assistance networks in the country. It is a phenomenal collaborative group of more than 100 partner programs providing a range of food security services that include food hampers, neighborhood food distribution, community meals, shelter and outreach programs, meals in residential and supportive housing settings, and supports to school nutrition programs. Our ultimate goal at the beginning of the pandemic was to ensure the continued safety of staff, volunteers, and program participants. Some of the programs in our network closed, and that was by design. Vital service programs increased their capacity to deliver services. Staff and volunteers were redeployed to help out where they were needed most, and essential food services have continued and actually grown since March. More than 2.5 million pounds of food, 67,000 food hampers, and over 500,000 meals have been distributed throughout Waterloo Region since March. We are incredibly grateful for the support of local, provincial, and national partners as we continue to navigate the pandemic. The growing community need and plan to prepare for what is yet to come is dependent on these partnerships. The regional Waterloo Community Services and Public Health Departments have helped to guide a pandemic plan and framework for action that allowed us to keep moving forward and to pivot to address the changing needs of our community. Support from the province of Ontario and the government of Canada has provided funding for food purchase, operational support, and essential pre-packed food hampers that will be essential if we were to go to a period of lockdown or if staff and volunteer numbers begin to decline. We want to thank you, the community, for your continued support, your food and financial donations that are helping us to have the security and the confidence that this essential work will continue and that healthy food will be secured and our neighbors will be fed. For those in our community who are worried, who are feeling food insecure, or may be concerned about their ability to feed themselves and their families in the weeks and months to come, I want to assure you that we are here. This amazing network of programs and services is ready to help. If you need food assistance or help to navigate the system of supports available to you and your family, maybe for the first time, please call us at 519-743 5576 extension 340. Our team is available Monday to Friday, 830 to 430 to help direct you to the help you need, regardless of where you live in Waterloo Region. Our vast network of services and supports will provide you safe access to food support. And through our network guidelines, we will ensure the safety and integrity of your food, the confidentiality of your family and provide a welcoming environment to ensure that you and your family have what you need as we all continue to live in this crazy world. 
Additional information about vital service programs is also available on our website at thefoodbank.ca. And to our community, we thank you so much for your generosity, your kindness and support. Although sometimes we have to say no to donations, to offers of volunteer assistance, to requests to start new programs and services, we appreciate the intent and the kindness, but please know that our decisions are in the best interest of the safety and security of every citizen, staff member, volunteer, and program participant. We want to do our part to flatten this curve again. Please keep an eye on our social channels and website for ongoing updates of needs, for donations, and for volunteer needs. Please read out, reach out to members of our Community Food Assistance Network who are, have growing and emerging needs as well. And for those who are interested in volunteering, we again encourage people to register for the Volunteer Action Center's Pandemic Volunteer Program. As things shift and change, all of our services will reach out to you and let you know how you can help. The safest and easiest way for you to help right now though, is to make a financial donation. During a state of emergency, systems and structures are important. Our food assistance network is safe, it is expansive, and it is doing amazing work to feed this community. We are in good hands, Waterloo Region, and with your continued support and understanding of the challenges that our neighbors are facing, and we will continue to face, we're gonna get through this together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Wendy, and please thank everybody you work with and um, your network of agencies, because I know it is a network, that's great. Uh, Nicole, do you have a question? Okay, so it's time for questions. Um, I am just wondering, uh, Dr. Wong and Chair Redmond, you have requested the support from the province to avoid a lockdown. Can you clarify, will we see potentially a lockdown announced today, this afternoon, or do you want to see if the province can help curb the case counts um, before that is announced? And why not ask for a lockdown given the recent surge and inability to reach all the positive cases accordingly? So I'll, I'll start and then let Dr. Wong jump in. And, and I would also acknowledge we have uh, Mr. Lochner on our CEO. He wants to respond. Do you know what, Nicole, when sometimes people say, what keeps you up at night? This is one of the questions that I ask myself. And um, I think that the province has acknowledged that Dr. Wong's section 22s that she's put in place, you recall one was about um, big box stores adhering to the the, mac, the capacity and, and the social distancing. And the other has to do with the Mennonite community. And locally, I really applaud um, the network of um, inspectors and um, the people that work with um, uh, Dr. Wong in public health and really use their relationships with the Mennonite community to try to avoid this. But when it appeared that the spike wasn't going to be contained um, through working with relationships in that community, she brought through a forward to section 22. So I think what our medical officer of health and our public health has demonstrated is that um, we took being in red very seriously. Dr. Wong is ready and able to, and does very judiciously when she um, declares a section 22 um, and does it when it's necessary, that we really are trying to keep our economy moving forward and allow our businesses to operate in a lockdown, it's just curbside delivery. There is no retail um, access. People can't go into stores. Um, even the 10 people that now are allowed in restaurants would no longer be allowed. So um, it is a balance. Um, we recognize that um, our numbers are spiking and everyone is trying really hard to reverse that trend. So, um, I, I can't predict what the province is going to do. As Dr. Wong said, we are the, the fourth um, largest um, spike um, in uh, COVID cases um, in, uh, at, by region in the province. So it, it is a huge concern. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Wong, do you want to jump in? Sorry. So I think, you know, there are no, there's no set criteria and there's no set timeline for when a region would move from red to lockdown. But we do know that usually it takes at least two weeks, if not two to four weeks, for restrictions um, that, you know, are, that have been put in to start to have an effect. Now, as you know, 
I have previously advocated for us to be at a higher level of restrictions than you know what the province had uh, maybe just a few days earlier put us at, and 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 they correspondingly then a few days later put us at the level um, that I'd advocated for. But that's because our indicators uh, warranted us to be moved to the appropriate level. At this point, you know, there's a, there's a few things. One. We've only been under red for a week and a half. Two, we do have increased rates, uh, like we're seeing in a lot of, um, you know, uh, the areas around the GTA. And uh, however, we also have um, significant spread uh, ac across um, uh, certain Mennonite uh, groups, as as you're well aware. Uh, and uh, you know, as of as of this morning. Um, we have at least 150 cases associated with that spread. And so what I have done is added to the work that's already been ongoing that Chair Edmund talked about, um, you know, with all the partners and the community leaders and members themselves to try to really get um, that spread under control. So there has been action of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a much more significant, um, um, there has been action that uh, has put in place much greater restrictions on an, on, on an area um, where there needed to be these restrictions, right? So those have been put in place. And so, um, you know, while we are working at, um, uh, controlling the spread in that area, as well as continuing to control the spread in the rest of our region, um, we need uh, some additional resources to help us. Other health units that have had surges earlier than us have received additional support and more support than we currently are receiving. And so we now are surging and want additional supports as well, so that we can have, uh, you know, uh, the best opportunity uh, to be able to be successful under not only the current provincial restrictions, but the additional restrictions um, uh, that, uh, for example, I have brought in myself. So it's, it's, it's about what we think is best for Waterloo Region uh, at this time. And, and I think uh, we need additional supports from the ministry and we need to continue our actions to try to control the spread in the areas that it's occurring. And uh, we need some time to see the impacts of that. I don't know if Nicole, Bruce wants to do something. Oh, sorry. Nicole, do you have a supplemental? I do. Um, just me, give me one quick second. I need to pull it up here. Um, the outbreak at the Cambridge Fire Station, we have heard that this is impacting more than the two cases listed on the dashboard. Um, can you tell us how many cases this fire station is dealing with and how many additional firefighters are having to self-isolate due to being a um, high-risk contact? And did, did this fire station have to shut down services for any necessary deep cleaning and sanitizing? Uh, it would be my uh, our, our team in public health that would be working, you know, as we speak on any workplaces where the situation may be evolving. Uh, and so I wouldn't have that information on me right now, but, uh, um, you know, I'm sure if there's any updates to our dashboard, for example, that will show up at 1.30 and we can maybe follow up with you a little separately after the briefing uh, to see if there's any additional information we can provide. Timothy, do you have a question? Yeah, I was, Dr. Wong, I was just wondering about, uh, yes. you mentioned uh, indoor settings and need for ventilation. Mm -hmm. When public health goes into a workplace that may have an outbreak or has an outbreak, is that something that you check mm -hmm. regularly? Mm -hmm. If they don't have proper ventilation, are they told to get new ventilation? Mm -hmm. they're, told to, they're told to make the necessary improvements, yes. I mean, by and large, you know, facilities do have good ventilation. It's not like 
a, a, you know, an issue where, oh, this is, this is uh, a real issue in, in our region, but it is another tool in the toolbox that's important, especially as more people um, you know, are indoors now because the weather is colder. And so we just need to make sure that all the measures are maximized in indoor spaces, including indoor workplaces. Timothy, do you have a supplemental? Oh, I'm good. Thank you so much. Joanna, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, just about the additional resources that you guys have requested. Do you know when you're going to get an answer on that? Well, I can say uh, since last night, I've been getting calls. Uh, so um, we're, we're in the process of, of, of speaking to ministry representatives uh, today. And so um, I don't know what the outcome will be, um, but um, our experience has been that uh, um, ministry staff are um, very responsive and um, they are um, working as hard as they can to, to get us what we need. Joanna, do you have a supplemental? Yeah, um, just, I guess, a basic question. Uh, Dr. Wong, have you asked the province to put us into lockdown? I've asked the province for more resources um, of, uh, in order to um, maximize our chances of being successful under the current restrictions of the province, as well as the additional restrictions that I've brought in myself. Um, Kate, not Jeff, do you have a question? I'm sorry, my husband used this and then it didn't, he didn't change it back. I blame him. Um, yeah, uh, for, for Dr. Wong, or I don't know, maybe Chair Redman or even Bruce, you might have an answer for this. You know, when we're talking about Mennonite communities and even like newcomer populations, there are sometimes the language barriers or a technology barrier. They're not watching the local media. They're not listening to us. They're not watching CTV or reading the record necessarily. Um, so what more is being done to sort of address that and get the messaging out? Like, how, can you kind of describe how you're working with those communities? Like, who's going in there and how that all works? Uh, Kate, I, I have some folks that are working on this as we speak, and they would be better able to speak to it in, in, in more detail because, you know, they're on, the, they're on the ground on the front lines working with our partners. And uh, so I... I you know, if, if it's okay, I think I'll ask uh, our, our comms folks to connect with you after and to, to um, refer you to the, the most appropriate spokesman for that, for, 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 for this. There's, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes and it's not just public health, it's, it's our local healthcare partners, it's our local, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, our, 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 our area municipalities, it's our community agencies, it's, uh, a whole of community response and including the community leaders and the community members themselves. So um, I wouldn't be able to do it justice uh, this morning. I think Mr. Lochner would like to weigh in as well, Kate. Yeah, I was just gonna add to what Julie's saying. We'll get you the details, but to your point, it's it's really important. It's the approach that we've taken all the way along and we'll continue to, to work with the communities. And as Julie said, work with community leaders. Um, this has to be done in, in, in partnership and in understanding in acknowledgement, and um, and that's the approach that public health is taking. Kate, do you have a supplemental? Yes, please. Um, I'm wondering when we're hearing about contact tracing. You know, there were stories earlier on about how people were leaving fake names and fake phone numbers and that. And I'm wondering um, what cooperation in contact tracing is looking like now, because also in the the one release about the the Mennonite communities, it was that people weren't telling you who or public health who they were have been in contact with. So in general, how is that going? Yeah. You know, in general, you know, m most people are cooperative. Um, across the Mennonite communities, there's a lot that are cooperative as well, but um, there were unfortunately, you know, a sufficiently high number that were not such that we weren't able uh, to have the information that we needed um, in order to, um, have a good uh, line of sight on what was actually happening and the spread that was occurring. And so, um, you know, that's why um, more um, uh, more significant measures had to be um, put in place in order um, to enable us to uh, control it better. 
Um, but uh, you know, since the since the orders have gone in, uh, we have seen uh, a significant increase uh, in compliance. Uh, so so you know, and we're, and and we're and we're thankful uh, to the community members, um, you know, that um, that that are complying and working with us. Um, you know, uh, I I would say overall back to the overall community. I think what we're what we're hearing uh, a lot of is that people are tired of having to you know undertake the public health precautions and having to stay away from others. Especially you know some people were looking forward to the holidays and not having to do that and thinking maybe you know if our situation was better they wouldn't have to do that. So I, I think most of the time you know it's not a an outright um, not willing to comply. It's more people are tired. Uh, they don't really want to comply, uh, you know, um, but, uh, but, you know, we're still having, uh, by and large, people are still, are still complying. Uh, and uh, it's just, you know, maybe uh, they were hoping not to have to. Damon, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so my first question, I'm not sure who this is for, but on the um, dashboard on the map for St. Jacob's, it's still labeled uh, zero to five cases. I was just wondering what the reality of cases in the area is, because we know of the big outbreaks occurring at Village Manor yeah. still. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so thanks. So thanks. Uh, so, Damon. So, um we are going to be uh, announcing soon. Uh, it's going to be next week now, but we're working on it as quickly as we can. An update to our map. So the issue was um, we had some limitations with the data system that we had before, uh, in terms of um, you know being able to get exact um, uh, locations, and therefore that's why our current map uses postal code. But we know that. That's a bit of an issue in uh, rural areas where there's larger areas that can be covered by the same postal code. And so that can sometimes lead to an incorrect attribution of individual cases in a certain area of the, the rural uh, township. Uh, and so what we've, um, what we've uh, been working on is now that we've um, switched to the provincial system and uh, they've, you know, continually improve that provincial system. And, you know, we've uh, integrated um, more updates to it. We're now able to uh, pull information that's gonna be more accurate. And so starting sometime next week, I can't give an exact date, we will have an update to the map um, that, will, that will be more precise in terms of where cases are actually occurring. So I, I expect that what you'll see is that there's, no, there's not gonna be any more white in those small little areas in the in the rural townships where it's currently it's saying uh, not uh, not reportable because of a small number and it's going to be a, a little more accurate uh, in, in in these rural areas there's not going to be a big change overall uh, you know by and large it's still fairly accurate especially in the cities but in the rural areas it will become more accurate and i expect that you won't see uh, you won't see white anymore. And when that information is released, we're going to be giving specifics about what has changed, what has improved, and uh, so you'll you'll better understand uh, what happened there. Damon, do you have a supplemental? Yeah, and then just in terms of Village Manor, could you provide us a general update? Yeah, you know, I, I would refer you to uh, Lee Fairclough of St. Mary's Hospital because they're managing it on a day-to-day -day basis and would have even more uh, recent information than we would. We, we update the numbers that um, they give us every day on our dashboard in terms of the overall number of outbreaks. But, uh, you know, St. Mary's, what I can say is based on the based on what's happening on the ground, St. Mary's Hospital has been amazing. Um, uh, the, the leadership that Lee and her and her team have shown has been incredible. And, uh, you know, um, it, the outbreak is really being well managed. Uh, by St. Mary's. So we are highly, highly appreciative of, of, uh, of, of, of their work. Um, just wanted to say that. Irene, do you have a question? Yes, and thank you for the information, Dr. Wong, on uh, not having any more white, because as you know, yeah. air is white. <laughs> so Yeah, I know. It won't I'll be white sometime that. next week. So Okay, I'll be on that. Um, actually, my question has three within it. And I'm sure you can answer them all at once. 
Uh, do you think the numbers could be greater for the Mennonite community than what is being reported? Mm -hmm. Are the numbers for the Mennonite community coming only from those tested? And um, if not, where are you getting your numbers for the Mennonite community? Yeah, so you're correct, Irene, that the numbers that we release are uh, only the number of confirmed cases. And we do know that some will not, um, will not uh, get tested. But under my order, they still have to self-isolate uh, even if they don't get tested. Uh, and so, uh, not, not all of them, but uh, you know, people meeting the conditions of the order. Uh, and so uh, there will be an underestimate of the numbers um, based on the fact that um, uh, you know, not all of them will be tested. But what I can say is that um, we have had, um, you know, really, ba really based on the efforts of the, you know, the, the community partners, the healthcare partners, uh, the community leaders themselves, and the, the, the community themselves, we've had um, much more significant uptake of testing, especially in the last few days, um, than we were expecting. So, so, you know, at least that gives us um, a better line of sight. Uh, that's greatly appreciated. And um, it at least gives a sense of the spread, uh, which, is, which is important because the more we have a better sense of the spread, um, the more effective we can be in terms of um, our interventions. But um, so yes, so it, it, it likely is an underestimate that said, uh, due to the terms of the order, uh, people you know that uh, uh, we suspect may have COVID but haven't been tested uh, still need to comply with isolation requirements and things like that. And uh, what we've seen is, um, you know, we saw this even before the order, and we continue to see this, uh, you know, after the order. Uh, we we are we are seeing more cooperation. Um, and uh, it, it is helping. And so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more cases that are confirmed, if our numbers keep growing. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the situation is getting worse. It just means that we have a better picture of what has happened. And uh, so the important thing uh, are the interventions and are the actions that are taking place right now to show the spread. So the numbers may get higher for a period, but then they should go down afterwards in terms of, or, or rather the, the, they won't go down because they're the cumulative number, but the number of people that are going to get resolved is going to go up. That helps. Irene, do you have a supplemental? Even though you had a three part first one, I'll give you a supplemental. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Wong, can you offer an estimate of what percentage of the Mennonite community has been tested? No, I can't offer that percentage. Okay, thank you, that's it. Thank you, um, does anyone have a burning question that they, oh, everybody does, okay. Um, Kate, I saw your hand first, go ahead. Thank you, um, I just wanted to ask Dr. Wong, um, you know, as we get closer to Christmas, people may start getting emails from well-meaning family members who say, well, we're not supposed to have you, but why don't you just come anyway? We'll, we'll have a small gathering. And, you know, as we get closer to Christmas, that pressure gets a little more. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's any advice or if, if public health will be addressing sort of that in the coming weeks. Like, how do we address those family members who really are like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Just come on down, we'll have a big dinner anyway. Yeah, you know what, uh, Kate, you're um, describing something that is very common and all of us feel that social pressure, uh, especially with friends and family. We don't wanna say no to, or we don't wanna be the odd person out that says, no, I'm not gonna join, um, right? So I think it's a very, human thing to feel the pressure. Uh, and I would just say, really, uh, the situation in Waterloo Region is serious. And we have seen after every major holiday, <laughs> what has happened to spread because people have been gathering. 
And so the, I think the most important message that I'd like to pass is that please, you know, stand up for what you feel is the right thing to do. And if you stand up and you say, no, thank you. I, I, I understand the sentiment is like, it's, 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 you know, it's well-intentioned and, and, you know, but I, I need to do this because this is going to help our community. And I need you all to do this as well with me so that we, we all do this together and we help our community. Uh, it, it's, I, I think the more that individually that we stand up and that we encourage our friends and families to stand up and do what's right, um, you know, despite the pressure, which is, which is very understandable, the more successful we'll be. We, we, this, is, this is an issue across Canada. This is why the, the, the feds are talking about, this is why individual premiers across uh, provinces are pleading with their population not to do this. Because every time a bunch of people gather at the holidays, there's a spike afterwards and it just makes the community spread worse. So I think, you know, for me, what, I, what I'm focusing on right now is making people understand there is a direct impact between our behaviors that we can control and what happens to our community, which then impacts everyone beyond ourselves individually. And just for them to really, just for, just to pass the message to everyone in our community, we all have to stand up for our community right now. We all have to do everything we can to help each other, incur including encouraging our loved ones and our friends not to gather outside of their immediate households. Mr. Lochner, I saw that you unmuted and then remuted. Did you want to add to that um, reaction? Yeah, I'm sure. Kate, if you asked everyone on this call, we'd all say something similar. We're facing, I'm sure everybody, every one of us, the same pressure to gather. And how do you convince us, each other, anyone else? I, I don't know that any of us have that answer. Um, I just to emphasize what, what Dr. Wong said, you know, I think of what gift can we give? Is it possible to give this gift to the community, give it to each other, which is to hopefully get through and start to open things back up in January. I know that delays things a few weeks, um, but I wonder about that. Um, I also know that Lee Faircloth spoke at our pandemic control group this week and talked about the presence of spread in the community now being, being caught by staff. So when we talk about our essential workers, our firefighters, our nurses, our doctors, they're not getting this in the hospital. Uh, for the most part, they're not getting this in the healthcare settings for the most part, they're getting this in community. And the gathering, I really worry that the gathering will start to impact our staff like we've never seen it before. And that those essential services are, are increasingly at risk. I didn't feel this way in the spring, we were worried about it, and aware of it. But now I'm quite concerned that that, um, that gathering could lead to some significant challenges for essential services. And that worries me. So Hopefully the gift we can give to healthcare is to delay our gathering until we have, uh, have less spread. Wendy, did you want to weigh in? Um... Yeah, you know, my, my answer to that question is, is be creative. I just came back from York Region and um, dropped some great goodies off for my parents so that they can have some fun things to do for the next three or four weeks when they aren't going to see us. And you know, I think we all have to, as community leaders too, we all have to do our part and set a really great example. And uh, it's going to be hard for my family. It's going to be hard for my staff. We're already having conversations about, you know, things that are going to dramatically change, but we're also knowing that we have essential work to do in this community and we have to keep ourselves healthy and safe as well so that we can keep doing that essential work. And that's really important. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to celebrate really huge next Christmas. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Damon, did you have a qu another uh, question? Yep. Um, so for Dr. Wong, uh, in terms of transmission levels, compliance, and testing, what would you need to see in the Mennonite communities to repeal the Order 22? And what day are you looking at kind of reassessing the situation? Well, I can say we're monitoring daily. And um, uh, first and foremost, we need to see evidence that the spread has come under control. So I don't have an exact date. 
Um, but um, you know, the more cooperation that we do get, and I want to emphasize, I want to emphasize again, a lot of a lot of members of, the, of these communities are cooperating now. But the more that we get in terms of cooperation, uh, the better the better testing numbers that we get, et cetera, all of that um, will will help speed up um, the, the 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 timeline uh, for when this outbreak will come under control. So it's too early to say at this point. Uh, we're going to have to give it some time, and um, you know I, I'll be I'll be available to provide a, a break set uh, uh, sorry updates uh, as we go along. Nicole, did you have a question? Sorry. Hi, this was in regards to um, I guess low risk um, of people who are considered uh, to have COVID nineteen, but they're low risk. They will no longer be notified by public health. And are you? Can you clarify no. you're asking them to reach out to people? No, I'm sorry. We are going to be notifying them, but we're going to be working with them to notify their own contacts. So they're going to be helping us notify their own contacts. We're still going to be reaching them, the cases. If you're a case, we're still going to connect with you. It's just that in lower risk situations where we don't have to directly investigate and call all the individual contacts, we're going to ask the cases to do that and we're going to give them information so they can do that. Okay. Yeah. Timothy, did you have a question? Joanna. It's a bit like when we sent out the school not notifications and, you know, like you know, we, it, we, we made it more automated. It went uh, as a letter from the parents, sorry, from the school, apologies, to the parents about what the parents now need to do for their children, et cetera, isolated, who get tested, um, things like that. It's, it's, it's a form of, um, uh, allowing us to, uh, you know, a little bit be more efficient with um, uh, with the uh, with the notifications, such that we can focus our resources um, uh, uh, directly on those situations that are considered higher risk. So where where we would directly do uh, contact investigation uh, and, and follow up. I'm sorry, Tim. Go ahead. No, Tim didn't have one. Joanne is next. Joanna? Joanna, yes. Yeah, another uh, Christmas question. Uh, like more specifically, I hear some people saying, well, what if I quarantine before I visit a family member? Or what if I get a negative test? What would you say to those people who have sort of come up with yeah. uh, ways that they think are safe to visit family outside immediate household members? No, it's, it's, it's not recommended. Uh, to, 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 it's, it's not going to be as effective and, and the, the testing isn't going to be uh, uh, effective that way. Uh, so, you know, testing yourself before you visit somebody, that means you're testing yourself to find out if you're, if you have enough virus in your system at that point in time. So you could get a test, you could be negative, and then you walk out the testing center and you get it. So it, it, it doesn't protect your family, it doesn't protect your friends. So this idea of getting a test in order to visit other people doesn't work. Not a good idea. And also it, it, it strain, further strains our, our, our laboratory system for a test that has no utility. And so for the purposes of, you know, trying to make sure you're clear before you can go out and socially gather, that is uh, definitely not recommended. Uh, in terms of self-isolation before they, um, you know, I can understand why people would think about that, but, but you know, we need to do more than that. We need to just not socially gather. We, why take the risk? Why, you know, continue to put uh, ourselves and our loved ones at risk? Just for now, temporarily, as Wendy said, we're going to have better Christmases in the future. For now, we need to make these sacrifices and, and we need to all pull together. What is happening in communities where there's a lot of spread it, 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 is that individual actions are ending up, you know, having a very significant community impact. So, and, and, but that also puts the power in our individual hands to really make a difference. And I think what people sometimes don't understand or they don't, it's not that they don't understand, they don't necessarily see right away is how can my individual actions really impact, you know, the, the, the community? Well, with COVID-19, individual actions really add up. 
And we know this from the experience. When more of us socially gather when, we're, when we shouldn't be doing that, it spreads much more quickly. So everyone taking a stand in, in, and not socially gathering when it's not recommended to, we'll, w- if we all do this and more of us do this, it will really have an impact on our community overall. Irene, did you have a, another question? No, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Locker, you have a late breaking bulletin? Yeah, somebody just sent me a, a tweet from one of the news outlets here, so thank you. <laughs> oh, share it with everybody. Uh, it, just said that, it just said that the minister confirmed that we are not moving to lockdown this week. Okay. Um, Oh, that's okay. all I have. Okay. Well, that's um, um, definite uh, answer for this week. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, Wendy Campbell, thank you very much for what you do on behalf of the community and being part of our community um, update uh, today. Uh, thank you, valued uh, media partners, for getting our message out. Um, and everybody stay well, and I'm sure we'll cross paths soon. Take care.